Welcome to the next lecture on sequence alignment and remapping from CBE 182. And so the main learning objectives for today's class is really to appreciate and understand the difference between a local and global sequence alignment. Um, it's also important to learn and understand what exactly a gap penalty is. Um, and also want you to take away you know, what exactly can you learn from a sequence alignment and what's what are its limitations? What what can't you learn from a sequence alignment? So for example, um, I want you to be able to understand the difference between identifying sequences that align well, that get a good alignment score, and uh, pairs of sequences that are actually homologous. So homologous uh, formally means derived from the same origin. Um, and how does, you know, how does uh, what's the relationship between two sequences that get a good alignment score and two sequences that are actually homologous? Can you infer homology from alignment scores? And finally, uh, it's important to learn and understand what exactly a dot plot is and what, what can you and cannot learn from a dot plot. And so a pairwise sequence alignment is really, formally speaking, just a mapping of bases from one sequence to another sequence um, with the use of one or more so-called gap characters. And so we already saw examples of alignments in a genome in our genome assembly lecture, uh, although I didn't form the collagen alignment. And so here I'm just showing you an example of alignment between two sequences X and Y. And you can see that uh, basically there's like a vertical bar uh, which shows a mapping between identical bases between the two uh, sequences. And you can see I've highlighted in red uh, basically either mismatches, which is the case uh, between the A and the C in X and Y. And you can also see gap characters. And so gap characters are really characters that are introduced when we think there's basically an indel in our particular position. So if you see the uh, column with a G in the X sequence and a dash in the Y sequence, um, that represents basically an indel where uh, either there was an insertion in the uh, sequence X uh, at the G position, or there was a deletion from the sequence Y at the gap position. Um, just based on the sequence alignment alone, you can't really tell um, whether there was an insertion or deletion there. So that's why these uh, positions are called indels. Um, but yeah, so basically the idea of, uh, of this pairwise sequence alignment is it basically allows you to look at sequences X and Y and basically um, see where all the differences are. And so there's, again, two broad classes of sequence alignments. One are called global sequence alignments, and the other are called local sequence alignments. And so the main difference is that in a global sequence alignment, um, you're really assuming that every base in one sequence, say sequence X, should have a match uh, in to every, you know, to a base or a gap character in sequence B. And so these kind of global sequence alignments are... Um, usually useful for looking at, say, like um, whole genome alignments between pretty closely related species. So like, say, you're aligning human versus the chimp uh, genome. You'd want to, for example, do global sequence alignment um, in order to kind of see uh, how the two genomes have evolved, or sorry, see how the two genomes have diverged since their common ancestor. Um, in, the, in local sequence alignments, um, the idea is that you're not trying to match all of sequence X to all of sequence Y. And so you might only want to be interested in finding like partial matches between one genome and another genome. And so this might be useful, for example, if you're aligning two very distantly related genomes, like say the human and yeast genome, where you don't expect that there's going to be, uh, you know, a direct correspondence of like chromosome one of human to like some chromosome in, in yeast, for example. Um, local sequence alignments can also be used for finding like multiple good match locations. So say, for example, you were um, uh, doing like long read sequencing and you wanted to find um, potential one to many matches between the read and the gene, the target genome. Um, you know, you typically perform like, say, for example, a local sequence alignment to find parts of the long read that might match parts of your target genome. And so sequence alignments have like a ton of applications in genomics, obviously, because DNA sequencing 
at least if you're doing short read sequencing, produces tons of short reads. And so oftentimes you're doing alignments to figure out, okay, for each read that you've sequenced, where on my genome did it come from? And so oftentimes you um, start with a bunch of reads, you start with some reference genome, like the human, reference human genome, and you align your reads to the reference genome to figure out where they, where they came from. And so, you know, one of the major applications that we'll be using alignment for in this class are basically, again, mapping sequencing reads to a reference genome. And so this applies for, for example, if you're doing resequencing, which is, again, trying to find differences between a target genome and your reference genome. Uh, it's applicable in tr uh, the transcriptomics lecture because oftentimes you're using your sequencing short reads from uh, transcripts and then trying to map them back to the genome to figure out what gene they came from. Uh, we'll use it in epigenomics because um, basically we'll be, uh, in epigenomics, we'll be talking about sequencing uh, genomic fragments that are near, for example, like um, histones with certain modifications attached to them. And so we'll be mapping uh, short reads to genomic locations to figure out where were histone modifications approximately located along the genome. Um, it's also useful for ChIP-seq, for example, when we are trying to identify where transcription factors bind across the genome, we'll be mapping reads to genomic locations where approximately a transcription factor is bound. And generally speaking, for most uh, DNA sequencing applications, you're doing some kind of mapping of reads to the reference genome to figure out where some kind of event happened. Um, some of the other applications that we won't talk as much about um, or have already talked about is, for example, genome assembly. So obviously, um, in genome assembly, we're talking about finding overlaps between pairs of reads in order to draw edges between them in a graph. So to figure out what kind of overlap there is between two reads, you have to align them to figure out where do they overlap the most. Um, you typically, people have done, a, people do a lot of sequencing, uh, sequence alignments to learn something about evolutionary history of genes. So for example, um, if you, uh, are sequencing some new genome of interest and you uh, sequence one particular gene, um, oftentimes if you're sequencing a new organism, you might not have any functional experiments performed on them. And so what you would do is you would take your newly sequenced gene of interest and you would align it against a whole database of uh, known genes that have already been characterized from, for example, like mouse or worm or fly or whatever, uh, in order to identify putative homologs. Um, so that you can then say, okay, well, my gene of interest that I don't know anything about, it you know has strong sequence similarity to a gene that is very well characterized in C. elegans, and so you can start to do things like um, you can start to try to infer some kind of functional information about your gene based on annotations of uh, genes in well characterized organisms. And something that we won't really talk a lot about is comparative genomics. So in the uh, in the field of comparative genomics, generally speaking, your you know, in a kind of very broad level, you are doing alignments between whole genomes of organisms or, you know, large portions of one genome against another in order to understand something about the evolutionary history of those genomes. Um, and a related problem is, uh, you know, oftentimes it's common to align the genomes of many organisms to form what's called the multiple sequence alignment, which we'll briefly talk about later in this lecture in order to identify which pieces of chromosomes are highly conserved across species and therefore more indicative of some kind of functional element in the genome. So an important question to ask is effectively what constitutes a good alignment, right? And so for a given pair of sequences, say here, sequence X and sequence Y, um, there's multiple alignments possible. Um, here I'm just showing you two examples, alignment A and alignment B. And so you need a way of, you know, when you're performing an alignment, you need a way of judging which alignment is, which of a, a set of possible alignments is the best. And so the, the simple idea here is that basically the best alignment is one that uh, yields in some sense the smallest edit distance. And so by edit distance, I mean, uh, for a given alignment, like if you look at alignment A, uh, alignment A, uh, you know, manages to match up most of the bases in sequence X to sequence Y, but you'll notice that there's two columns in which there's uh, differences. And so in the first red column, uh, you can see there's an insertion in sequence X relative to sequence Y, or equivalently, there's a, some kind of deletion in sequence Y relative to X. And in the second column that's color red, there's a 
basically an insertion in uh, sequence y relative to sequence x. And so essentially the distance between sequence x and y implied by alignment a is really a distance of like two because there's two positions that where there's differences. Uh, similarly for alignment b, uh, there's basically three positions where uh, there's differences and so alignment b suggests an edit distance of three. And so I think pairwise, pairwise alignment is predicated on the idea of maximum parsimony, which is another way of saying um, there's an underlying assumption that uh, the best alignment is the one that implies the fewest changes uh, between a pair of sequences. And so if you think about just kind of uh, measuring the quality of an alignment by the number of matches or mismatches implied by the alignment, uh, in many cases, this, this works out well. And so if you look at the top part of this slide, um, you can see that uh, there's two sequences being aligned, AAACGC and ACG. And alignment A versus alignment B give you two different possible alignments of these two sequences. And you can see that you know, intuitively, alignment A is better than alignment B because in both cases, um, you have the same number of gaps and alignment A gives you three matches, uh, whereas alignment B gives you one. Um, things get a little bit more complicated when you think about uh, the scenario shown on the bottom of the slide, where you have two alignments, alignment C and alignment D, and in both cases, you have three matches implied by both alignments. Um, and so you might think a priori, a priori, okay, well, these two alignments should get equally good alignment score. But if you think conceptually about what alignment C versus D implies about the relationship between these two sequences, you can see that alignment D basically just says, okay, well, you know, see the second sequence is shorter than the first. But hey, I could match all of the bases exactly from sequence two to sequence one, and they're all together in one clump GCC. Whereas alignment C, if you look at it carefully, um, yes, all three bases from the second sequence match uh, the corresponding base in sequence one, but there's a gap between the A and the CC, which implies that there was some kind of indel that happened in that position. Um, and so, uh, basically, if you think about a, you know, which of alignment C or D is the kind of most parsimonious explanation of the, of the two sequences, of the difference between the two sequences, you'll come to the conclusion that alignment D is still a better alignment, even though they have the exact same number of matches, because alignment C uh, implies that there was some kind of indel event. <coughs> um, in addition to whatever reason causes sequence two to be shorter than sequence one. And so alignment D is basically a more parsimonious explanation of the differences between the two sequences.